Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. Welcome to Informed Immunity, the podcast dedicated to bringing you the latest evidence-based information on vaccines, community health, and the fight against infectious diseases. I'm Susan Jara, Director of Patient Education at the Global Healthy Living Foundation and your guide on this journey to better health. In this audio guide, we'll review the basics of vaccination and explore how community-based initiatives and funding are critical in improving vaccination rates. Today, we are joined by Dr. Edith Merzion, Associate Professor of Clinical Pharmacy and Associate Dean of Curriculum at the University of Southern California. Dr. Merzion has extensive clinical practice experience in a wide range of pharmacist-led patient care programs in both medical clinics and community pharmacists. Welcome, Edith. Can you please start by introducing yourself? Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Dr. Edith Merzion. I am a pharmacist and associate professor and associate dean of curriculum at USC Alfred E. Mann School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. My clinical background is pretty extensive in immunizations and travel health, of which a big part is immunizations and managing chronic disease in an ambulatory care setting. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's jump right in with some Vaccine 101 information. And let's just start with the basics. What are vaccines? Well, vaccines are ingredients. They're antigens. Of course, they are drugs because pharmacists handle them, physicians handle them. But basically, they are ingredients that go into our bodies and stimulate an immune response to help our body create antibodies against these antigens to protect us from chronic diseases and vaccine-preventable diseases. Great. And there's a variety of types of vaccines. Could you talk a little bit about what types of vaccines are available? Sure. So, we have a few different categories and types of vaccines. We have vaccines that are what we call live attenuated, and we have vaccines that are inactivated. We have far more vaccines that are inactivated vaccines, which basically means that, you know, scientists use components of viruses or bacteria, just maybe like protein subunits, things like that from viruses and bacteria to create a vaccine that goes into our bodies and just stimulates our immune system to recognize it as a foreign antigen. And from that point on, our body starts to create immunity against this one thing. The live attenuated ones are, and attenuated really means weakened, so they're basically a live part of that bacteria or virus, but they're so weakened to the point where they go into the body and they need to replicate in order for your body to recognize them as a foreign antigen and it kicks in your immune response. But they're weakened to the point where they cannot replicate enough to cause disease. So we have very few vaccines that are live attenuated. The majority of vaccines available are inactivated, which basically means that they're killed off. They're bits and pieces of bacteria and viral proteins, DNA portions that are used to create these vaccines. And then Within those inactivated vaccines, we have mRNA vaccines, which in the recent few years have been more and more in conversation because COVID vaccine is an mRNA-based vaccine, or at least a couple of the COVID vaccines are. So that's been in conversation frequently lately. And mRNA vaccines are basically just the same as what I described. They're a piece of mRNA of the virus. And mRNA is messenger. It's messenger RNA. And we have this for, you know, it's everything. It's part of our entire physiology where the vaccine goes in and our muscle cells recognize it and they receive the message and they start to create a substance like a spike or a protein that looks like this virus. And that, in fact, sparks the immunity response, the immune response in our bodies to create antibodies against COVID-19, for example. So that's basically how vaccines work and the type of vaccines that we have out there on the market. Great. Thank you. That was just such a clear description. There are so many types and it could be confusing for so many people. So it's nice to just have a simplified explanation. You mentioned the phrase kicks in the immune response several times, and I think that brings us to the heart of what we really want to talk about today, which is the importance of vaccination. Maybe you can shed light a little bit about why vaccination is so important, especially for our audience who often live with chronic illnesses. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Vaccinations, bottom line, prevent the spread of disease. They reduce the spread of disease, of communicable diseases, and they also help reduce severity of disease. Because we have vaccines out there for a lot of things, but not all vaccines are always 100% effective. Like COVID vaccines, influenza vaccines, they don't protect you 100% from getting these communicable diseases. But what they do is once someone has an influenza vaccine, for example, they can still get the flu. However, the duration of the disease will be shorter. The severity of the disease will be a lot lower. And the best thing about it is that it will highly reduce hospitalization from influenza especially for people with chronic disease or other vulnerable populations like older adults, infants. So those are the things we're looking at for vaccines. Vaccines are a tremendous public health achievement. I always remind people that we always really have to think about what we have in terms of public health. Sanitation, water filtration, refrigeration, all of these things were public health achievements done in order to reduce the spread of disease, keep communities healthier, and vaccinations are just a part of that too where this is something that we have that's been able to, one, eradicate certain diseases from the globe, and two, significantly reduce the incidence of diseases and the severity of diseases and the complications that come with them in the populations that are vaccinated. So that's really what we need is for vaccines to prevent the spread of disease and to protect populations that are really vulnerable to these diseases. And I think that's so important to just bring to light the benefits of vaccination. But we also know that there is a lot of hesitancy around vaccination. Yeah. And this is often caused by fear of side effects or maybe people believe they're not tested enough or not safe. Mm -hmm. Can you touch a little bit about safety and side effects for vaccination? Of course. So really what goes into developing a vaccine is the same process that goes into developing any drug. So you start with the very basic research and development in labs and test different things. And it can take months to years to get to a point where you're ready to even test it in a human subject. And then you start by testing in human subject. That's when they go to clinical trials, right? So this is extremely highly regulated process. And different countries have different processes, but essentially they're all the same because they're testing for two things, safety and efficacy. So first they establish safety. So when they start testing in clinical trials in human subjects, what they're looking for in a small sample that they start with is safety. Is this safe? And if it's safe in the 100 or 200 people that they're testing in, then they go to the next step, which is either several hundred or a thousand people that they test in. So they continue to test for safety in a larger population. And now they're starting to look at efficacy. How efficacious is it? How well does it prevent disease? And what they're also looking at is when they give the vaccine to these people in the clinical trials, the participants, what is their antibody count? Are they creating enough antibodies to be able to protect them from this disease? That's how they're testing for efficacy. And then once that has been cleared and they've been successful there, then they go on to many more people, like tens of thousands of people, like the phase three trial. The next step would be tens of thousands of people that they tested in. Now they're still looking at safety and efficacy. So it undergoes so much scrutiny and testing. And those are the two primary things that they're looking for when they develop vaccines. So a lot goes into it. And essentially, nowadays, vaccines are so much more safe and effective. I mean, they have been for decades, but we're just much more sophisticated in processes now and with technology now. So vaccines are, are clean, they're simple, and they're very effective. Thank you. I think that's so important to talk about, especially, you know, in lieu of the COVID vaccine, where there's so much skepticism around how fast it came out. I know that side effects also are talked about a lot in our community. Mm -hmm. People worry, are they going to get the flu from getting the flu shot? You know, so <laughs> I hear that a lot. Maybe you can help that clear that up. <laughs> yeah, that's something I address quite often with patients. And in fact, we really teach our students how to communicate more than anything. Like they gain the knowledge about vaccines, but what they really need to do is learn how to communicate properly with their patients and their communities to tell them how these things actually work. I've heard a lot that I don't want to get the flu vaccine because I don't want to get the flu. So most of the flu vaccines out there, all of the injectable flu vaccines are inactivated. 
they're just killed off. So I've never known anything that's like been killed off and come back to life. So uh, they're really just parts, bits and pieces of the flu virus. And it's not a whole virus. So there's no way that it could actually replicate and cause the disease. So it works to stimulate your immune system to create antibodies against the flu. But while it's doing that, your body's recognizing this as an antigen. And it says, oh, I recognize this thing, alert, alert, the red flag goes up and your immune system says, okay, I recognize this thing and I know what I'm supposed to do. So body starts to create antibodies. But in that process, it's very likely that a person can experience side effects. Vaccines are drugs. If we get a vaccine and we experience no side effects, hey, that's great. But it should really be expected for at least 24 to 48 hours. It's common to experience mild symptoms of the flu. So it would be a mild fever. It would be some body aches and maybe a mild headache, but it won't last long. It'll last for a day or two. And some ibuprofen or acetaminophen and hydration can help with that. But the good thing is it's just adverse effects and it's very short lived. With that said, I always also caution people that consider the time of the year when you're getting your flu vaccine. There's already flu happening. So once you get a flu vaccine, it takes your body about two weeks to really build that antibody level to give you that proper immune response and protect you from the flu. Now, if you have just gotten the vaccine and you're exposed to the flu, like you go to a party or you talk to your friends or have dinner and someone has influenza and you catch it, well, you know, your body hasn't had enough time to build that antibody level to protect you yet. So sure enough, it's very likely that you could get the flu just when you've gotten the flu vaccine and you start to experience symptoms that last a little bit longer and make you feel ill. So that's likely too. But it does take your body some time to fully protect itself. Great. So I get my flu shot tomorrow. I won't be alarmed if my arm is sore or if I have a slight fever. Yeah, your arm could be sore and a slight fever, but it doesn't last long, right? But another thing is something to consider, especially for vulnerable populations that have higher risk of complications from the flu, that if you get your flu vaccine, again, it's not going to 100% protect you from ever getting the flu. But if you do get the flu, but you are protected by the vaccine, then your chances of being hospitalized are significantly lower significantly like there was a study a couple of years ago in medicare patients over 50 the statistic was insane it was like that 300 percent reduction in hospitalization from vaccination alone from flu and covid so at least if you're vaccinated and you get the flu then it won't be severe enough to get you into the hospital and it protects you from a lot of the other co-infections and complications and what about timing of vaccinations? You know, I'm getting my flu shot tomorrow. I have friends who got it at the end of August. I have some friends who wait longer. How do you know what schedule is optimal for you? Really, the best time to get your flu vaccine, because let me back up for a moment. Every year we have a new flu vaccine because the composition of the flu vaccine is really based on what strains of the virus are most prevalent that year and possibly most detrimental. So the composition changes every year. And we want to make sure that our bodies are protected, that we are all protected, especially in the peak flu season, which is typically January and February of every year. That's when flu seems to peak. Now, with COVID over the last few years, that peak time really did change because you know, so many people were home and we weren't socializing as much. So it just kind of changed that wave. But we're kind of getting back to that where January, February are the peak of the flu season. And if people are vaccinated September, October, that's prime time to establish really good immunity all the way through the peak season. So we advise people not to get the flu vaccine too early. Like early August is not favorable. There's not a lot of flu going around at that time, even though the vaccine's available, but it's available so we could give it to our very vulnerable populations. But for the general public, September, October is a pretty good time to get it. Just so your immunity doesn't wane through the next nine months too early so that you're covered in the peak time. And we're talking about flu, but there 
there's also COVID, RSV, some other, you know, important vaccinations. How do you know the scheduling of that? What resources would our patient community turn to? I love that you're asking that question because I always like to point people in the right direction to go to the most credible sources. And you're right, Susan. I have been talking about influenza, but a lot of what I'm saying applies across the board to all vaccines. So thank you for bringing that up. I would point people to the CDC website, cdc.gov. That website, just type in vaccines, and there's a wealth of information and very, very easy to read and comprehensive at the same time. You can find accurate information from this credible source. The ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, is a subset of the CDC, and this is a huge committee. They meet three times a year and they make suggestions and recommendations on vaccines and how they recommend vaccines be administered. So, you know how we say everyone 65 and older needs to get a pneumococcal vaccine. Well, the people who make that determination are the ACIP because they review hundreds, thousands of research data, everything that's out there to put these recommendations together to see who's our highest risk population, when do we need to get this population immunized for them to be safe and protected? So the ACIP really is the body that makes this determination and they recommend it to the director of the CDC. And then once that is approved, they publish these schedules. So I would encourage the public, go to the CDC website and look up the ACIP schedules. You find schedules for children and adolescents from newborn to 18 years based on age. And then you have another recommendation list based on any chronic conditions that they might have. And same with adults. We have an adult ACIP schedule based on age group. And then we have one that's based on, you know, conditions. For example, healthcare workers, pregnant women, people with immunocompromised conditions, people with liver disease, people with a chronic respiratory disease. These are all different columns. You can look on this chart and see what the ACIP recommends as routine vaccinations for everyone. I think that is really the best and easiest to access source of information for people who have these questions. I would also recommend that they do talk to their healthcare providers, talk to your physicians, talk to your pharmacists. Your pharmacists are such an accessible point of contact. If you have any questions about these things, your healthcare providers should really be your best source. You can find the information on the CDC website, but a lot of times what people need out there, especially if you don't have a healthcare background, you need this information interpreted in a way that would make sense to you and your condition and answer all of your questions. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great point. Absolutely. Especially if you're taking other medication and you have to talk about the timing of your medication with the vaccination, it's important to communicate with your provider. We also have a list of vaccine resources at ghlf.org backslash vaccine dash resources. And we'll place that link in the episode description if you'd like to access it. Edith, you mentioned briefly just how valuable pharmacists are for vaccination. Can you talk a little bit more about the pharmacist's role in providing immunization? Yes, let's do that. Pharmacists for decades have been one of the most trusted professions, and people have such a great level of access to their pharmacists, especially if you have one point of contact, one pharmacy that you go to, and you have a relationship with that pharmacist. And, you know, they're a great source of information. Pharmacists are doctors of pharmacy. They have very, very extensive doctorate level education and knowledge about drugs and vaccines and their use and when it's the right time to get them and when it's not the right time to get them. So there have been a lot of studies out there about people accessing pharmacists. And some of the data out there has shown that about 90 percent of people live within five miles of a pharmacy. About 50 percent of people live within a mile of a pharmacy. And basically, people go to the pharmacy at least twice as much, if not more, than they go to their physician's office. So thinking about how the pharmacies and pharmacists are situated in communities, that is a tremendous asset for people in a community. 
So go to your pharmacist, ask them, access them. You know, pharmacies typically have longer hours, which actually helps when people are working different hours and they're not able to take time away from their jobs, because a lot of times that might mean that they don't, you know, they have to take a pay cut if they lose hours of work. So having pharmacies available in communities with different hours of operation really helps get immunizations out to the public and and not just immunizations, but health information, drug information, answering questions, helping people address self-care issues, like things that they're experiencing that can be treated with non-prescription therapies and non-pharmacologic therapies. Your pharmacies are a great resource for these things to keep communities healthy. Absolutely. Pharmacists are great resources, and especially how you mentioned, if you can't make it to a doctor's appointment, the hours don't mesh with your employment or child childcare, lifestyle, that it's very accessible. Right. I mean, let's face it. Sometimes it's hard. People have transportation issues. Not everyone owns a car. And sometimes it's tough to get on the crowded buses. And your work hours might not match up with when your physician's office is open. So people have all kinds of barriers to access. And I think that's really where pharmacies come in to help communities with access to this kind of care. Exactly. And we can't leave out hourly workers, right? That just came to mind. To, you know. Right, exactly. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the community pharmacy and clinic-based collaborative practice and patient care programs you've implemented over the years? Sure. Oh, wow. We're talking, okay, now about 25 years I've been working as a pharmacist and maybe more than that, actually. I've worked in different settings. One of the most exciting, honestly, was hepatitis C. So this is back about 20 years ago where hepatitis C medications were not as sophisticated as they are now. And people needed them, but the combination, the regimen caused all kinds of complications, like it would reduce white blood cell count, it would reduce red blood cell count, it would cause depression, it would cause a pain, it would cause all kinds of different things. So we got that off the ground to really help our liver doctors, our liver physicians who were having a hard time managing the number of patients and all of these complications. So we built the program to basically manage these patients and manage all of these issues that they were having with the medication regimen. And then, of course, my favorite of all, really, is travel health. And travel health includes basically in all kinds of diseases that people can acquire with global and international travel, depending on their reason for travel, where they're going, how long they're staying, what they'll be doing there. So, you know, it's really all about infectious disease, foodborne illness. It includes vaccines. It includes diseases that are not vaccine preventable because we don't have vaccines for them. And really educating and informing your travelers that what they could do to protect themselves and have a safe and and enjoyable trip and how they need to protect themselves from some serious conditions. And then, of course, immunizations. I've just been involved with immunizations for most of my career and helped a lot of community pharmacists really learn how to implement immunization services in their pharmacies. Thank you for all your contributions over your 20-some years. Community-based initiatives are so important for education, and they're also so important when it comes to equity. And I know there's still some challenges in achieving equitable access in vaccines, especially in underserved communities. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what you've witnessed over the years and what strategies you've found beneficial in overcoming these barriers? Yes, I can. So some of the things that I've observed I'll tell you one of the biggest barriers is economic, uh, economic barriers, whether that is being able to take time away from work, especially if people are hourly workers, to access care. Another is health insurance. You know, health insurance a lot of times is tied to employment. And if people don't have the kind of job with an employer that can offer health insurance or if it's too expensive for them to afford, then they don't always know where they can access this care for free or at a significantly reduced cost. So it's really important to have the messaging in communities so that people are aware where they can access care. And, you know, health literacy is part of that, too. 
that is also a very big barrier. Health literacy is basically what people understand about health and health care and access to health care and really understanding that there are myths and wrong information out there and where to find right information at a level where they could really understand and interpret and apply to themselves and their families. And, you know, health literacy is typically tied to education level, but not always. So those are some of the issues that we see. Mobility is always an issue, people getting places, transportation. But something you touched on, Susan, earlier in this conversation is also a big deal. There's just a significant social mistrust in some healthcare practices, and that stems back decades into like even the early and mid 1900s. And there's communities that distrust the medical profession, the healthcare practices, and government. And really, through no fault of their own, it was just basically what happened historically that created this mistrust in healthcare practices and government. So, I mean, that's a really big thing to address, kind of a topic for another day. But nonetheless, it does still exist. And a way to overcome that, that I've actually seen be very effective, is for people to really engage their community members. If you don't have, as a healthcare provider, as a government agency or an official, if you don't have that kind of relationship and that level of engagement with your community, how do you expect them to really listen to what you have to say and really take it to heart? People need to trust their healthcare providers. People need to trust people who are supposed to be taking care of them so that they can make good decisions and informed decisions. And that's something that we saw with COVID because you did say that people were very wary of the vaccine because it came out so fast. But in fact, it didn't come out as fast as people thought. That virus was isolated in 2019. So we already knew what the virus was. So very sophisticated, but very widely used technologies were used to isolate this virus, replicate and start testing it. And that's why like all of this stuff was being done in the background while COVID-19 was even just brewing to identify what this is. So it went through all of the processes that every single vaccine goes through to come out on the market. But what happened was, you know, the FDA formed these advisory groups and people went out and had focus groups and talked to their community members. They talked to people in different communities to ask them what their concerns are. And if we're not asking our community what their concerns are, we won't know how to address their concerns and validate their concerns and really provide the type of information we need for them to feel confident. We need to increase vaccine confidence by really addressing their primary concerns and then providing factual information, correct information, and helping our patients talk through their decision. Like helping them with that decision-making process, working with them on that, I think is really effective. Thank you, Edith. Yeah, we want to inform individuals and we hope that they take our messaging and spread it to other community members. And uh, hopefully we could do our part to help with that mistrust, help with that education. Thank you so much. You really broke down what vaccines are, how they work, how to talk to your provider and pharmacists, uh, how to access them at the community level. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure speaking to you today and thank you for joining our podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure talking with you. This is Informed Immunity. Thank you for joining us on this audio guide. Remember, the fight against infectious diseases is a community effort and your participation is crucial. For more reliable information on vaccines and to stay up to date on the latest in public health, visit our website at ghlf.org or check out the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or World Health Organization website. This podcast was made possible with support from GSK. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate our podcast, write a positive review, and share it with your friends and family. It will help more people like you find us. Until next time, stay informed and stay healthy. Together, we can make a difference. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network.